Listening Section Directions This test measures your ability to understand conversations and lectures in English. The listening section is divided into two separate timed parts. You will hear each conversation or lecture only one time. After each conversation or lecture, you will answer some question on it. The questions typically ask about the main idea and supporting details. Some questions ask about a speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speakers. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to help you answer the questions. Notes will not be scored. In some questions, you will see this icon. This means that you will hear, but not see. Part of the question. Some of the questions have special directions. These directions appear in a gray box on the screen. Most questions are worth one point. If question is worth more than one point, it will have special directions that indicate how many points you can receive. You must answer each question. After you answer, click on Next, then click on OK to confirm your answer and go on to the next question. After you click on OK, you cannot return to previous questions. In an actual test or during this practice test, a clock at the top of the screen will show you how much time is remaining. The clock will not count down while you are listening. The clock will count down only while you are answering questions. Click on Continue at any time to dismiss these directions. Listen to a conversation between a student and an employee at the university print shop. Hi there. I saw an ad in the campus newspaper about some services for students. I wanted to inquire about that. Oh, great. Are you interested in applying for a job with us? We have a few positions available. Oh, no. Sorry if I gave you the wrong impression. I'm looking to print some materials for my independent tutoring services. My schedule changed, and I want to promote my services to other students. Oh, I see. Sorry for the confusion. Printing materials for promotion is what we do here. We can help you with that. That's perfect. What options do you suggest for promoting my tutoring services? Well, one popular option is to print flyers. They're eye-catching and can be distributed around campus. Additionally, we recently had someone who customized pencils with a printed message to promote their club. It was unique. Customized pencils? That sounds interesting. Can you tell me more about that? Sure. Customizing pencils involves printing a message or logo on them. It's a creative way to catch people's attention. Just keep in mind that custom pencils might be a bit more expensive compared to other options like flyers or business cards. Another idea we have is printing on sticky notes, which can be useful and attention-grabbing. Wow, I didn't realize there were so many options. I appreciate the variety. How much does each option cost? The cost depends on the quantity and the specific design you want. For example, a batch of standard design business cards starts at around $15. However, custom pencils may have different pricing based on the complexity of the design. The business cards sound interesting, but I'm intrigued by the pencil idea. Is there anything I should consider? With custom pencils, you'll have less space to include detailed information compared to business cards or flyers. If you prefer, we can also help you with custom designing business cards here at the print shop. That way, you have more control over the design and the information you want to include. Why does the student go to speak to the man? What does the man imply about customized pencils?
What does the man imply are the disadvantages of using pencils to advertise? What did the student learn from someone who customized pencils? Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. The business cards sound interesting, but I'm intrigued by the pencil idea. Is there anything I should consider? What can be inferred about the student when she says this? Is there anything I should consider? Listen to part of a lecture in a marketing class. Today, we will be discussing the fascinating topic of green marketing. Green marketing refers to companies promoting their products as environmentally friendly. It may surprise you to learn that the interest in green marketing has been growing for decades. It gained significant momentum after the first Earth Day in 1970. What does green marketing mean to you? Well, Professor, I think green marketing is about promoting products that are good for the environment and encouraging consumers to make eco-friendly choices. Excellent. You're right. Green marketing focuses on promoting environmentally friendly products and encouraging consumers to adopt sustainable behaviors. To understand the origins of green marketing, we need to look back to the first Earth Day in 1970. This event sparked widespread environmental activism and led to the passage of important environmental laws such as the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Endangered Species Act of 1973. As environmental issues gained more attention in the news and entered the mainstream, businesses started to recognize the potential of green marketing. In 1975, a prominent advertising trade group held its first workshop on ecological marketing, marking the formal entry of green advertising into the industry. Now let's talk about the principles of green marketing. It's important to note that green marketing campaigns should follow the same principles as traditional marketing. They need to attract attention, stimulate interest, create desire, and motivate action. To illustrate these principles, let's take a look at a case study on an eco light bulb. This compact fluorescent light bulb was initially marketed as the eco light, with a strong emphasis on its environmental benefits. However, this approach didn't resonate with consumers who were more concerned about cost and convenience. The campaign was revised to highlight the cost savings and convenience of the bulb, which ultimately led to its success. Now let's explore different degrees of environmental responsibility in green marketing. There are extreme green companies that not only offer environmentally friendly products, but also prioritize sustainability in their operations. On the other hand, there are lean green companies that may focus solely on recycling office materials. Companies must align their entire operations with their green marketing messages to build brand loyalty. Finally, we must consider the ethical aspects of green marketing. Authenticity is key. Companies must ensure that their environmental claims are valid and supported by genuine efforts to reduce their environmental impact. False claims about a product's environmental friendliness should be avoided at all costs. What is the lecture mainly about?
How does the professor organize the lecture? According to the professor, why didn't the ecolive didn't resonate initially? What does the professor imply when she mentions companies that are extreme green and lean green? What opinion does the professor express about green advertising campaigns? Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. Now let's talk about the principles of green marketing. It's important to note that green marketing campaigns should follow the same principles as traditional marketing. They need to attract attention, stimulate interest, create desire, and motivate action. What does the professor imply when he says this? It's important to note that. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to explore the fascinating role of trace metals in biological processes, specifically focusing on the importance of zinc and carbon cycling. Now, let's start by understanding the significance of trace metals in living organisms. Trace metals are essential elements that living organisms require in small quantities for various physiological functions. One such trace metal is zinc, which serves a nutritive function in many organisms, including humans. Now let's dive into the role of zinc in carbon cycling. Carbon dioxide, a byproduct of respiration, needs to be converted into other carbon-containing molecules that organisms can use. This conversion process is crucial, and it is facilitated by an enzyme that contains zinc. Plants, too, heavily depend on zinc, especially in the process of photosynthesis. During photosynthesis, carbon dioxide is transformed into organic compounds, and the same enzyme, facilitated by zinc, plays a vital role in this process. Professor, how do marine plants cope with the scarcity of zinc in their environment? Great question, Mark. Zinc is indeed scarce in certain environments, such as surface waters of rivers, lakes, and shallow parts of oceans. Interestingly, marine plants, including diatoms, thrive in these zinc-limited environments. Diatoms are microscopic photosynthetic organisms that contribute significantly to carbon cycling. They make carbon available to other organisms in deeper ocean layers. However, a groundbreaking discovery challenged our understanding of trace metals. 
researchers made an astonishing finding that some diatoms utilize an enzyme containing cadmium instead of zinc. This discovery revolutionized our perception of cadmium as a toxic element for all biological life. It turns out that organisms can use cadmium as a substitute for zinc when zinc is insufficient in their environment. This finding raises intriguing possibilities. If diatoms can adapt to using alternative trace metals, it leads us to wonder if other organisms also employ such strategies when essential metals are scarce. Further research is needed to explore the broader implications of this discovery. Understanding the role of diatoms in carbon cycling is of utmost importance, especially considering its potential impact on global warming. As we know, carbon dioxide is a major greenhouse gas, and diatoms' ability to make carbon available to other organisms in the ocean can influence the overall carbon balance. What is the lecture mainly about? What does the professor imply about the conversion of carbon dioxide? According to the professor, how do marine plants cope with the scarcity of zinc in their environment? According to the professor, what is the important function of diatoms? What point does the professor make when she talks about cadmium as a toxic element for all biological life? The professor states that the finding of an enzyme containing cadmium is astonishing. What are the reasons behind this? Listen to a conversation between a student and her biology professor. Good morning, professor. I wanted to talk to you about something exciting that happened over the weekend. I attended a volunteerism conference, and it was amazing. Good morning, Emily. That sounds wonderful. What did you learn at the conference? I met people from different organizations and learned about their work in helping communities. 
It sparked my interest in volunteering, and I'm considering getting involved. It feels fulfilling to make a difference. That's fantastic, Emily. Volunteering can be a rewarding experience. It's great to see you passionate about making a positive impact. Did anything else catch your attention during the weekend? Yes, I also visited the beach, and there was something incredible. I witnessed glowing jellyfish in the water. It was mesmerizing. Ah, glowing jellyfish. That's a fascinating phenomenon called bioluminescence. It occurs due to a chemical reaction within certain organisms. Many marine organisms, including jellyfish, exhibit bioluminescence. How does bioluminescence work, Professor? Well, bioluminescence involves the production and emission of light by living organisms. In the case of jellyfish, they have specialized cells called photocytes that contain a protein called luciferin. When luciferin reacts with oxygen, it produces light. This natural light emission serves various purposes for marine organisms. That's amazing. What are some of the functions of bioluminescence in marine organisms? Bioluminescence serves several functions. It can be used for communication between organisms of the same species, attracting prey by luring them with light, or even as a defense mechanism against predators. In the case of jellyfish, they utilize bioluminescence to evade predators near the ocean's surface. This is also fascinating. I'm thinking of researching glowing jellyfish for my term paper. Do you have any advice on how I should approach it? That's a great topic, Emily. To make it more manageable, you could focus on specific types of jellyfish that exhibit bioluminescence or explore current research on bioluminescence in general. Additionally, it would be interesting to consider how these glowing jellyfish fit into the local ecosystem and their ecological significance. You could even reach out to the environmental groups you met at the conference for insights and potential collaboration. Why does the student go to see the professor? What does the student say about the conference she attended? What caused the student to become interested in bioluminescence? According to the professor, why were the jellyfish that the student observed glowing? What does the professor suggest on the student's research proposal?
Listen to part of a lecture in an astronomy class. Today we will delve into the fascinating world of comets. Specifically, we will focus on periodic orbit comets like the famous Halley's Comet. These comets have orbits that bring them back to the sun predictably after a certain period. So let's start with the concept of periodic orbits. These are orbits that comets follow, bringing them back to the sun at regular intervals. Halley's Comet is a notable example, known for its relatively short periodicity of around 75 years. Halley's Comet returns to the sun every 75 years. Now let's dive deeper into its trajectory. It originates from the outer solar system and ventures closer to the sun, reaching a point about twice as close as Earth. After this close encounter, it retreats to the outer reaches near Neptune. During its brief appearances every 75 years, Halley's Comet captivates observers. Now, let's discuss the composition of comet nuclei. These nuclei are primarily composed of ice and dust. As comets approach the sun, they undergo heating, causing some of the ice to vaporize into gas, which disperses from the nucleus. This process results in the gradual shedding of material during each orbit. Now let's move on to an intriguing question. Given the age of the solar system, how does Halley's Comet persist? Does anyone have any thoughts on this? Yes, Sarah. Despite the billions of years since its formation, Halley's Comet continues to exist due to its periodic orbit professor. Exactly. Although the solar system is ancient, periodic orbits like that of Halley's Comet allow it to persist. However, it's important to note that these orbits are transient phases in a comet's life. Eventually, they can lead to fragmentation or breakup. Now let's wrap up our discussion by briefly exploring comets with elongated parabolic orbits. These comets only occasionally approach the Sun and are known as open-ended parabolic orbit comets. They may have their orbits altered by gravitational interactions with planets like Jupiter or Saturn. These interactions can potentially transform their orbits into shorter, more frequent trajectories, similar to periodic orbit comets like Halley's. What is the lecture mainly about? According to the professor, what occurs when a comet approaches the sun? Why does the professor emphasize the periodicity of Halley's Comet? What does the professor imply about the trajectory of Halley's Comet? What is the professor's opinion about the name open-ended parabolic orbit comets?
According to the professor, what can alter a parabolic orbit into a periodic orbit comet?